Uh, my name is Reed Brody. I am a lawyer with Human Rights Watch. Okay. And um, can you speak to uh, generally the uh, Ken Roth's um, article that he wrote um, about you know Human Rights's perspective, Human Rights Watch's perspective on Iraq as a humanitarian intervention? Yeah. I, I, there's no doubt that Saddam Hussein um, is one of the great human rights uh, abusers of our time. Uh, and Human Rights Watch has been consistently um, trying to get the world interested in the crimes of Saddam Hussein. Uh, but for a long time, nobody was listening. Uh, in 19, uh, what was it, 1989, 1990? Uh, in, in okay, hold on a second. Just, uh, yeah, just start from the top. And okay. Gonna... You want me to start from the very top? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's no doubt that Saddam Hussein is one of the great uh, human rights criminals of our time. Uh, human Rights Watch has been documenting uh, and trying to call attention to Saddam Hussein's crimes uh, for many years. Um, but for a long time, no one was interested uh, in the late 80s, when Saddam Hussein uh, committed genocide against the Kurds, when he used poison gas to lay waste uh, to entire Kurdish villages, uh, when he trucked tens of thousands of Kurdish men into the desert and just killed them, uh, the United States uh, refused to condemn those crimes. Um, I was in Geneva at the time working uh, on the, uh, working at the United Nations, working, sorry, okay, okay. Start, yeah, I start, for, yeah. um, uh, in, I was, I was working in Geneva at the time trying to get the United Nations Commission on Human Rights to criticize Saddam Hussein's use of uh, poison gas against his, against the Kurdish population. The United States refused to co-sponsor a simple resolution uh, criticizing Saddam Hussein for these executions, uh, for the use of poison gas, uh, for Halabja, the, the murder of, 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 of the Kurds. Uh, it was at the time when the United States was actually supporting Saddam Hussein in its war against Iran, when it was providing uh, intelligence information to Saddam Hussein. Um, so for the longest time, uh, the United States and, and many other countries were not interested in Saddam Hussein's crimes. Uh, we tried to get uh, any country uh, to bring a case of genocide uh, against Iraq uh, after the uh, Anfal campaign in which uh, hundreds of thousands of Kurds were killed. Uh, nobody would do it. And uh, let's, <clears throat> let's go back and, and, and <clears throat> go through kind of the legal process of what would happen. A lot of people only see armed intervention as the only solution for punishment, but what are some other options? Well, we've been trying uh, for many years, uh, let's say, let's go back. Um, we had been trying for many years. Um, oh, I'm sorry, when you say we, can you say? Okay, Human Rights Watch. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Human Rights Watch was trying for many years to get a country uh, either to bring a genocide case against Iraq or to indict Saddam Hussein. Now, obviously, uh, you know, a legal paper, a legal indictment doesn't itself, uh, you know, bring down a dictator, doesn't itself stop crimes. But as we've seen it with Slobodan Milosevic and uh, Charles Taylor in Liberia, the fact of indicting someone for genocide or war crimes delegitimizes them and, and begins to create a dynamic that undermines their rule. And so we were trying for the longest time uh, to get uh, the rest of the world to uh, focus in a legal way on, on Saddam Hussein's crimes. And, and, and we were not successful. And what are some of the uh, attributes that you think of why the governments were so resistive to that um, push? Well, <clears throat> well, it wasn't really until the invasion of Kuwait that uh, the balance of power and the way Saddam was looked at really shifted. And until that point, uh, the United States was, was you know, supporting Saddam Hussein in, in, in different ways. And it wasn't uh, it, in the United States' uh, narrow interest, perhaps. I don't want to say that it wasn't the United States' interest, but, well, um, you know, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, before Saddam Hussein, uh, let's, 
Uh, it wasn't until Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, really, that, that, that things changed and people started to discover all these crimes that he'd committed before. And, you know, when Saddam Hussein was committing genocide against the Kurds, when he was using poison gas, um, he was actually being supported by the United States, by France, uh, with, in this case of the United States, uh, you know, intelligence information, um, uh, credits and things like that. And, and, and of course, France uh, was providing armaments to Saddam Hussein. So they didn't see the interest uh, in, 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 you know, criticizing or condemning Saddam Hussein for his crimes. Okay. Um, I think in uh, Ken Ross' paper, he lists some reasons such as, uh, uh, let's see, commercial interest. They want to jeopardize future commercial de deals, squander the influence in the Middle East, mm -hmm. and buy terrorist re retaliation and cost too much money. Can you talk about yeah. elaborate on some of those? Well, you know, it's generally countries don't attack other countries. Uh, uh, let me say, generally countries don't uh, you know, don't like to upset the status quo um, by, you know, condemning the leaders of another country. And in the case of U.S. and Iraq, prior to the invasion of Kuwait, uh, you know, you had economic interests. Uh, Saddam Hussein was also seen as, as, as a stable leader uh, in an in a, in a, in a unstable region, a, a, a lay secular leader uh, in a region with a lot of fundamentalism. Uh, you know, there were long-term commercial interests, oil interests, uh, and so the United States kind of played it safe and, and you know, and, 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 and stayed on the side of Saddam Hussein. Okay, and um, if, let's go through kind of a hypothetical of, of if, if Saddam was indicted for this genocide, and then what? You know, does he have to leave the country until we can get him, or, or what? Well, you know, the indictment of uh, a leader for, for genocide or for crimes against humanity by a foreign court um, doesn't automatically, uh, you know, remove them from power. Um, but we've seen uh, that it does begin the process of undermining their rule. Um, once Slobodan Milosevic was an indicted war criminal, uh, you know, his days were numbered. Once Charles Taylor of Liberia was an indicted war criminal, uh, you know, it invites all kinds of um, tactics from the international community. They don't deal with him. Um, you start to treat him as somebody who shouldn't be in power. He can't travel. His assets start to get frozen. And, it, you know, in many ways, it's the beginning of the end. And you know, it would have been preferable um, to try those kinds of delegitimizing tactics. And can you talk to <coughs> kind of the legality of you know, this so-called regime change <coughs> that the um, um, United States was approaching and some of these, you know, compare, contrast that with these... More yeah, we don't, let's just say that Human Rights Watch, as, as Ken made clear in that article, we don't get into the... Um, legality of the regime. We don't get into... It's beyond your mandate. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, I have some plenty of other questions. Uh, now, a lot of people, you know, they, they give the better late than never argument. Um, and you address that a little bit. So All right, you sure. You know, the United States went in... Or, you know, one of the justifications that the Bush administration gave um, for the invasion of Iraq was Saddam's crimes. And, you know, let's be clear. I mean, Saddam is a major league human rights criminal. But the real, you know, the real genocides, the real massive crimes that he had committed were, had been committed 10 years before. Um, in the late 80s, um, the genocide against the Kurds, the, uh, you know, the, the repression against the Marsh Arabs in the South, the quelling of the Shia uprising. These things had happened 10 years before the invasion. Now, there's no doubt that, you know, getting rid of Saddam Hussein uh, could be a benefit for the Iraqi people. Um, that Saddam Hussein was a tyrant, that he was using torture. But the, the human rights, uh, the emergency justification for an invasion would have, ha would have been... Oh, that's Radio France International. One second. Read Brody. Um, 
take that just from the top because there's a lot of a lot of pertinent. Okay, topics. sorry. We're, what we're we talking about? Uh, we're talking about the uh, better late than never argument. Okay, starting. You know, um, uh, one of the justifications that was given for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, was uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, human rights crimes. Now, let's be clear, Saddam Hussein is one of the you know, all-time human rights criminals. Um, but the fact is that the worst crimes that he had committed, the genocide against the Kurds, the suppression of uh, the Shia rebellion, uh, the, the draining of the marshes to, to kill the marsh Arabs in the south, um, had been done 10 years before the U.S. invasion. Um, so, you know, the, the humanitarian intervention justification might have flown in, you know, the late 80s or the early 90s, um, but not in, you know, not 10 years later. And can you kind of elaborate on that, the, kind of the threshold aspects of the distinction that you make of, of stopping imminent or ongoing? Yeah. I mean, it's just between us. I mean, that's, I think, and there's a little this, this difference with Ken. I mean, that is our, you know, an intern, more of an internal kind of justification. But, you know, if, if, you're, if, you know, if you're going to upset the rules of international law and go in to invade a country, uh, you know, without United Nations authorization in, you know, apparent violation of the traditional rules because you say there's a humanitarian emergency, we got to get in there, then you do it when the humanitarian emergency is real. You know, you don't do it um, because a country is engaged in, you know, in a lot of torture, um, as bad as and condemnable as that may be. You do it when you're actually going in to save tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of lives. Okay. And um, speak to, you know, was there any evidence or was there anyone even claiming that the, that was happening, genocide or? You know, there, there was, uh, at the time of the U.S. invasion, um, you know, Saddam was, was, was still a brutal leader. Um, you know, there was still torture being used against political opponents. Um, you know, there was still, you know, a total lack of f political freedom. Um, but nobody was alleging, uh, credibly, um, you know, that there was, you know, uh, killing on a mass scale or that there was any kind of imminent danger of, uh, uh, of you know, mass killings or of genocide. Okay. And uh, one thing that I, you know, can you speak to, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're, I'm hearing right now is the first time I'm hearing it, partly because a lot of this has been framed by the politicians and the media being complicit in that. So can you speak to that phenomena of when politicians are, in a way, cherry-picking right. this information? Well, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's fascinating to see that, uh, um, you know, it's fascinating to see, for instance, that the destruction of Halabja, which is kind of the paradigmatic, you know, destruction of a village um, through chemical weapons, the photos, the women and the children, you know, frozen there uh, uh, from the chemical weapons, um, that happened 10 years ago. Um, you saw a lot more of those photos, and there was a lot more discussion of Halabja 10 years later, w on the eve of, you know, during this buildup um, to the invasion of Iraq. Um, so the information that, you know, was in the public domain but didn't really get a lot of attention at the time it was happening, uh, when something could have been done about that, um, all of a sudden was, you know, in the public domain, on the front pages, 10 years later, as part of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the drumbeat to war. And what expertise do politicians have in human rights? Well, you know, I think that all politicians uh, should have expertise in human rights. I think that should be a lot of what politics are about, is defending human dignity. Um, but the fact is that what we see here is just a lot of cherry picking. You see, well, hey, this guy had rape rooms. This guy did torture. This guy, you know, Bush started talking about, and I could be wrong here, but uh, Americanly, I'll say, you know, um, you know, American leaders. Okay, uh, so just start. start yeah. from I mean, Look, a politician should be experts in human rights because that should be what politics is about, you know, protecting human dignity, protecting human life. Um, but what we saw here was really a lot of cherry picking. Uh, U.S. leaders talking uh, for the first time 
about chemical weapons and halabja. Not when it happened, um, but you know, as as uh, justification for you know military action ten years later. There's uh, distinctions that um, Ken makes in his article that the dirty hands argument that there was a lot of complicity at the time, uh, and it and some people see that as another form of cherry picking of saying yeah we did this but we were also supporting them. You know the uh, the, I mean, the argument. You know, the argument is made that, well, it's, it's wrong to talk about uh, Saddam Hussein's abuses because the United States at a, cert, at a time was involved in those abuses. Well, the United States should come clean and, and you know, talk about its involvement in those abuses. But uh, I don't think that undermines, or um, let me do that differently because I'm but not... The, the, I think the distinction that Ken makes is that there was no imminent genocide or still mass right. killing going on in a way that trumps the past complicity and that if, if and the point he makes well no he, he, he that, says it should if if there was a mass killing going right, on that it would then trump. there should be an intervention regardless, regardless of, of yes, the, so yeah so I think that's the point yeah that okay um you know it it's I mean the U.S. Um, was an ally of Saddam Hussein at the time that the worst crimes were being committed should that require silence uh, later in the face of genocide or, or mass crimes? No. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not, that's not a big, I'm not a big fan of that argument, actually. Um, you not personally or human rights? Uh, I'm not. I mean, Ken and I have some disagreements on different subjects. But, um, you know, should, I mean, he kind of, if I recall his article, I mean, he kind of puts that, you know, just says, puts that as a side, say, look, I mean, that shouldn't, he may, he t if I recall, he takes two arguments about why um, he, he kind of says these are not legit, these are not arguments. Let's put to aside to to the side these two arguments why the United States should not act. One is that it didn't have clean hands, and two is that we don't act everywhere, and you know that's not that th those are not good arguments not to intervene. So I mean, he's kind of they're kind of footnotes as it were, but. Well, can you speak sure. maybe in a general term? Uh, it seemed like during the build-up to the war, the humanitarian cause was almost a footnote. And then as it was starting, you know, with the whole campaign was about Iraqi liberation and freedom and right. a human rights cause. And then even to this day, it is the primary justification. Right. So there's a clear switch. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, there were a number of justifications that were presented for the war in Iraq. There were weapons of mass destruction. There were the ties with Al Qaeda, and there were human rights. And uh, you know, as the other arguments, uh, you know, lose credibility with each passing day, uh, you know, as the, we don't find weapons of mass destruction, as the links with Al Qaeda, you know, prove to be, you know, you know, tenuous at best, um, they're left with the human rights argument. And so the human rights argument assumes even even greater importance because it's the only remaining argument. Okay, and uh, it, can you, Ken mentions in an article that one of the reasons why they didn't, human rights didn't take a position was that it was a kind of a footnote. Right. And after the war, it uh, it became a, more of a, a primary justification that he felt compelled to speak out. So you can yeah, I mean, as an organization, Human Rights Watch doesn't take a position normally on war and intervention. Um, we believe that our best role, our best, the best thing we can do to help protect lives and save civilians is by monitoring the conduct of troops in a war. And so we don't, we feel that our, um, our, uh, our expertise and our value added comes in monitoring the conduct of intervention. The only times that we do support armed intervention is when it's necessary um, to stop a genocide or you know a similar level of atrocities, um, the kind of thing uh, that was happening in Rwanda in the 1980s, um, the kind of thing that may be happening today uh, in in the Sudan. Um, we felt that there may have been that justification. In fact, there was that justification uh, in the late 80s when Saddam Hussein was committing genocide against his own people, um, but that that uh, justification did not exist 
at the time of the U.S. intervention and had not existed for quite some time. Okay. And can you give a sort of a, a historical perspective of, of how human rights are used as a political ploy by politicians to, to gain support for military interventions? It, it seems like this probably isn't the first time that this has happened. And, um, talk about that phenomenon. Sure. I mean, you know, I, unfortunately we're very used to seeing our work um, held up to uh, support uh, armed intervention uh, when, you know, it otherwise may, may not be justified. And, and of course we are always producing uh, information on, uh, you know, on human rights abuses, on atrocities. And we're calling on the in uh, international community to do something. That's why we do our work. We are not, uh, we are not here to just document uh, torture and killings. We're here to stop torture and killings. Um, uh, but what happens is that uh, we put out all this information, uh, whether it be on, you know, Turkey or Sudan or Colombia or Indonesia, and uh, what we find that it gets used very often uh, when it's in the interests of politicians, you know, to point the finger. Now, we're delighted that people take our information and use it. Um, but it needs to be used uh, appropriately, it needs to be used at the right time, and it needs to be used for the right reasons. Okay, and uh, Ken kind of lays out four guidelines in a way to... Uh, I don't remember those. The, well, one was that it should be the last option. Yeah. Uh, it should be guided by primarily humanitarian purpose, that you should respect international human rights and humanitarian law. Actually, there's five. Uh, re reasonably likely to do more harm than good, and then mm. you prefer the endorsement of the UN. So. Okay. You know, I mean, even as we, I mean, this question of humanitarian intervention um, is, is an important one. I mean, what do we do in a situation like Rwanda, uh, where there is a genocide? Uh, there is a need for the international community um, to intervene, to stop you know, mass killings. We can't sit back when uh, genocide or tens of thousands of people are being killed. Um, but how do we do that? How do we do that particularly if, if um, let, me, let me, should I go back from the top? Um, yeah. Just, okay. Go ahead. Just, I, I, know know. All, I threw out a lot of stuff. Okay. No, 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 but that's okay. Um, I mean, one of the, one, one of the, 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 the critical questions in the world today is what is the international community supposed to do in the face of imminent or, or actual you know, genocide or, or you know, a similar level of mass killings. And I think uh, most of us would agree that morally uh, we have a duty, if we can, to save lives, tens, tens of thousands of lives. Uh, the question is how? Um, obviously, the first test is whether or not the international community as a whole uh, approves of that intervention. That doesn't mean uh, that we should allow ourselves to be blocked by a veto on the Security Council. So, if, you know, if China or Russia or, you know, raises its hand and says, you know, we don't want you to go in and save lives and, and stop a genocide in Rwanda, we need to think of, you know, how to do, how to, um, Anyway, so, um, you know, that doesn't mean that if one country on the Security Council, say China or Russia, you know, you know raises its hand to veto it, um, that the international community, you know, should, should be prevented um, from stopping a genocide. Um, but certainly that is the first test. Is the United Nations behind this? And that is always the better course of action. Um, second, you need to think whether you're going to do more harm than good. War, people always die in war. So if you're going into, say, 5,000 lives, but the war is going to cost 10,000 lives, or, or, you know, the war is going to upset the international status quo, or the war is going to destabilize a region, uh, you got to think about that. Um, so the second test is, uh, you know, can you actually save more lives? Um, then, then you're going to, to, to lose. The third, I would say, is good intentions. I mean, is really the purpose uh, here to save lives, or is it to invade and occupy and take over the country? 
And I think, you know, the world sees that kind of thing for what it is. I mean, if you're actually going in, uh, you know, to save lives, to set up a democracy, and then you're going to leave and, you know, then I think, you know, that's one thing. If you're going in to occupy the country, to install rulers, to take over the country's economy, and to decide the country's foreign policy, I think it has to be looked at uh, in a different way. What were the other ones? Uh, there was uh, respect international uh, human rights and humanitarian law, uh -huh. and it's the last option. Right. Um, another test, of course, is, is how you pursue the war. Uh, just war theory uh, says that not only should the war be just, but the way you fight the war should be just. So that if you're going in uh, for humanitarian grounds, uh, you don't use methods um, you know, that are designed to kill civilians or designed to do any more than uh, you know, the least possible damage. I mean, you go in in a way that is respectful to the extent possible uh, you know, of human rights and uh, of the Geneva Conventions. And finally, I think you know, the, the most important criteria is that it should be the last resort. Um, you know, war uh, is always, an intervention is always going, you know, to, uh, to lead to destruction and death. And it's always important to first try everything else, whether it be uh, targeted sanctions against the leaders, whether it be delegitimization, whether it be diplomatic pressure, um, whether it be isolation, whatever it is, you've got to try every single thing before you really, you know, go in and, 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 and you know, break all the eggs. Okay. And uh, applying some of these options, uh, you know, just from uh, explaining these, how did those kind of play out in Iraq? From well, if we look at Iraq, we see, first of all, not only was it not endorsed uh, by the United Nations, um, but there was a majority on the Security Council against the intervention. So it wasn't a question of, of, of a simple veto. Um, second, uh, well, I let me think about these. Whether I mean, it's hard to say whether there's more harm. I mean, it, it, let me, let me at least look at the, give you the ones that are clear, okay. rather than look at each one. Um, Just from whatever comes to yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, look, when we look at these, okay. First of all, not only was this intervention not done with the authorization of the United Nations, it was done in clear opposition to what a majority of the international community felt. And, and uh, in fact, it seems like a majority of members of the Security Council were opposed to it. Not just one veto-wielding country, um, but the U.S. could not get even a simple majority on the Security Council. Um, second, it's clear that this was not done as a last resort. Uh, there, was, uh, there were weapons inspectors in at the time. Um, there was, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of road yet to go down um, before, this, uh, before this intervention uh, would have been the only way uh, to deal with the problems that were raised. And uh, I think Ken mentioned uh, cluster munitions and cluster bombs. And yeah, I mean, the United States waged, um, uh, let's be clear, the United States military went to great lengths to minimize civilian damages uh, in its targeting decisions, uh, in the methods it employed. But still, our research shows that hundreds of lives, hundreds of civilian lives, could have been saved had the United States not used cluster munitions in urban areas, and had it not um, attempted to go after high-value targets without advanced preparation. Of 50 strikes against uh, so-called high-value targets, people like Saddam and others, zero uh, reached their mark and many of them resulted in civilian casualties. Okay, and do you ever, uh, it, I know there's a lot of controversy over depleted uranium, do you have any? Yeah, I'm not, I don't, I do, but I don't know enough about okay, depleted uranium. Okay, that's fine. One thing that I noticed is that when I look at, you know, let's say State Department reports on um, the uh, human rights records, a lot of their footnotes and sources go right back to the non-governmental organization community and very little 
primary, you know, first-hand source material on human rights. So can you speak to your evaluation of that? Well, I mean, actually, that's getting better. Um, oh, I'm sorry. What is yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the U.S. each year prepares a uh, what they call the State Department country reports on human rights, which are the human rights records in each country in the world. And um, they are very much uh, uh, reliant on information provided by national as well as international non-governmental organizations. More and more, uh, the State Department, where it's possible for, for it to do so, is actually going out in the field and, and collecting its own information. We've encouraged uh, the State Department, and most embassies, um, there is a person who's tasked with collecting information um, on, on the human rights situation. Of course, it's more uh, perhaps authoritative when it, the State Department speaks in its own voice. And, and one thing that I've seen that it seems a blurring of the lines uh, in a way is, you know, can it puts a number, a round number, of around 250,000, a quarter of a million Iraqis. And, uh, and then I hear politicians like maybe Joseph Lieberman or others who are saying million, or then I, then I hear million to millions of people killed. So uh, I know it's probably impossible to put a clear number, but you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, is it being exaggerated, or where are they getting that information from? You know, it, it, human rights reporting in under um, it's very difficult to. Uh, state precisely how many Iraqis died under Saddam Hussein um, because it was such a closed society, because uh, uh, we, there's so much that we don't know. We and, and other groups have talked about 250,000, 300,000. Um, the number could be higher because we know a lot more, for instance, about the genocide against the Kurds in the north than we do about what happened with the Shia and the Marsh Arabs in the south. Uh, information is coming to light um, each day. Um, but there is, there does seem to be kind of a number inflation um, a, a by proponents or, or those who, who uh, justify the war, who start talking about millions. There may well be many more than 300,000, but we don't have that information yet. Okay, so it's unsubstantiated in a way. Yeah. Um, the, another thing is, uh, when I looked into, uh, after the war, they were uncovering mass graves, and from what, what my interpretation and recollection is that from 1967 there were this many people missing, uh, and you know that number may have been 300,000. So then that number became we found 300,000 people in mass graves. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it seemed to be a, a, a blurring of that, like oh we just found 300,000 people yeah. buried in the ground, you know. And I've talked to people who've said that that's what. It, yeah. Um, so is that a misperception or is that a boring? Yeah, w uh, we don't know. There's no way that we know how many people have been um, found in the mass graves. One of the problems is that in the immediate aftermath of the war, the mass graves were not properly guarded. I mean, obviously, Iraqis' uh, family members were very anxious to find any remains of their loved ones. And so we found that uh, bulldozers were being used in mass graves, which, which upset, actually, the evidence and made it, even, made it much more difficult to determine with any accuracy the number of, uh, of people who, who are buried there. I, we have no idea um, how many uh, people have been found in mass graves. Okay. Um, and uh, have you looked at uh, some of these dossiers that are um, coming out of the government uh, recapping a lot of these human rights um, violations? I, have, I haven't. I, maybe somebody else here has seen them, but I have not. Okay, because I was just wondering, you know, okay. if you saw any. Um, now, d during the buildup to the war, you know, how many times were either Ken Roth asked by the um, the television news media or the print news media to comment on human rights? You know, in, in the immediate uh, build-up to the war, we were being asked about human rights in Iraq so much more than we had been asked, you know, in the 10 years before. I, perhaps uh, only, only uh, in the immediate <laughs> uh, run-up to the previous Gulf War um, had we been asked so much about human rights in Iraq. Um, you know, those of us who have been working on this issue uh, for, you know, for 15 years, um, you know, it was somewhat jolting to see all of a sudden people, the media, the news 
uh, are interested in what we have to say about human rights in Iraq. And I know that you know Ken uh, eliminates some of the uh, uh, you know one of the two, one of which is the dirty hands. The other one was that there's more worse crimes elsewhere, so we should have focused on those instead of this. Now. I realize that's part of the argument, but I want to just, can you give an, an, an overview? Some people think that Iraq was the, mo the, the worst human rights violations currently going on in the world. Can you get, just kind of give me an overview, a picture of what else is going sure. on? Sure. I mean, Iraq uh, was, and, and even in, in a, you know, um, uh, uh, I mean, okay. yeah. You know, there are, there, are, there are many human rights disasters in the world. Um, Iraq uh, was one of them, certainly in the 80s and, and early 90s. It continued to be a very bad human rights situation. Um, but let's also look at uh, the Sudan, for instance, where you have in the, you know, in a long-running uh, civil war, you have millions of people uh, who have died. Uh, you know, where the government uh, for a lo the longest time uh, cut off all humanitarian assistance uh, in the south of the Sudan, where uh, in just in the last year, um, over a million people have been driven from their homes in the eastern Darfur region. Uh, um, actually, the western Darfur region, sorry. Um, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, you know, where and, and then you can, you, you can focus on, you know, other ones. And, Maybe even list what you see as like the top five and okay, where, where yeah. Iraq ranked. And yeah, that, yeah, and that. okay. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of human rights disasters uh, in the world uh, in the last several years. Um, in the Sudan, uh, for the last two decades, uh, the south of the Sudan has been effectively uh, starved. Uh, by, by the central government, um, not only uh, through, uh, through, through war policies, but also through preventing any humanitarian assistance from getting in. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the west of the Sudan in the last year, in the Darfur region, over a million people have been driven from their homes. Uh, uh, it's the world's greatest humanitarian disaster. Um, in Chechnya, uh, Russian troops uh, have committed uh, systematic uh, war crimes uh, in the Chechen Republic. Um, uh, mass killings, torture, uh, disappearances, um, and which continue uh, uh, to this day. Uh, in um, China, China, well, China. I wouldn't put China in the same in the same category. I mean, China's bad, but it's not like. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, in, 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 in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, in, in, in cycles of, of, of genocide and revenge and revenge, um, particularly in the eastern region of the Congo, it's estimated that in the last several years, three million people uh, have died uh, in uh, both inter-ethnic violence as well as violence perpetrated by Congo's neighbors in order to loot the country uh, of its natural resources. Um, in, in Liberia and in Sierra Leone, uh, I, I personally have never witnessed the kinds of horrific crimes uh, that, I, that I saw in Sierra Leone. You know, the signature atrocity of cutting off people's arms and legs um, committed by the uh, uh, rebels, supported by the then leader of Liberia, Charles Taylor. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of situations that, that merit, uh, uh, you know, international attention and certainly uh, merited greater international attention. I, I don't like to say greater, actually. Okay, I don't that's, like that's to come, fine, yeah, okay. Um, the, uh, you know, some people say, you know, Saddam is worse than Hitler. So can you just, you know, make that historical comparison or? Oh, you know, it's it's you know, I, I we don't know, we don't, you know, okay. these. The, I mean, I would, I to me, Saddam is is one of the world class all time criminals. Um, you know, I I I certainly pers I certainly do put Saddam, you know, in 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 the rankings up there with, uh, 
you know, with Idi Amin, with Mengistu, with, uh, I mean, it's hard to make a hierarchy of evil. Uh, Saddam was a very evil and is a very evil man. Okay, that's fine. Um, the, uh, you know, I've heard some arguments uh, from the left that, you know, Turkey was a human rights violator towards the Kurds. You talked about, you know, Kurds yes. and, you know, you always heard about Iraq's treatment of the Kurds, but, you know, yes. give me some idea of the, both the nature and the scope uh, comparatively. Yeah, I mean, in, in for, for many years, um, Turkey uh, carried out a very violent and brutal repression against the Kurdish population in the southeast. I mean, entire Kurdish villages were uprooted. Um, people were forced into, uh, you know, larger settlements. Um, the Kurdish language was not permitted in, in education. It was not permitted in, uh, you know, in, in communication. Um, you know, Kurdish leaders were rounded up. Uh, you know, many, I, I, unfortunately, I actually don't know the numbers on stuff like that. But, That's fine. Uh, you know, well, what yeah, I want to give, yeah. I guess, in a way is... Uh, I wouldn't the, compare it, actually, to what Saddam did. I mean, okay. it was not well, the, on the um, same level. The, you know, with U.S. support, you could say. I mean, yeah, I mean, put it that way. I mean, you know, the, the government of Turkey, um, for many years, um, actually, uh, I mean, for many years, the government of Turkey, which is a very close U.S. ally, um, has, you know, um, you know, for many years, the government of Turkey, which is a very close ally, has visited a brutal repression uh, on the Kurdish population there. Um, I mean, K Turkey, which receives, you know, b very big U.S. support, which is a member of NATO, which has, uh, buys arms uh, from the United States. Um, you know, used those arms uh, in uh, its repression. Uh, you know, I have to be you have to be very careful here about because there was a whole thing about helicopters and stuff, and I don't actually, and we're always very careful about how we do that. And I, our people there would, you know, I would have to be very careful well, what I say. But anyway, I'm Iraq. talking about the heli No, I'm talking about the Turkish helicopters that were used in the southeast. The okay. American well, helicopters. I guess what I'm trying to get southeast. at in a way is uh, that if you take the administration's claims on their face and that if human rights is their primary concern, then what about our allies of Saudi Arabia or Egypt yeah. or, or Turkey? And yeah. so talk in, sure. maybe I mean, in a general way, like sure. how so I'm happy to do that. Yeah. the United States ignores the human rights violations right. of our allies. Yeah, you know, I mean, look at, I mean, human rights should be a core element of our foreign policy. Um, but look at which countries are receiving the most U.S. assistance in the world? Egypt, where torture is systematic. Uh, Israel, um, you know, where, which, you know, whose repression of its Palestinian population, um, you know, is very well documented and very clear. Turkey, uh, which, uh, you know, for years has visited a brutal repression on the Kurdish population in the southeast, Colombia, uh, you know, which which uh, where the military and its paramilitary allies, uh, you know, have committed widespread uh, human rights abuses. In fact, there's almost there is in fact a direct correlation between the amount of American assistance that a country receives and the amount of human rights abuses that it's engaged in. And. It seems to me that some people are aware of this in America, but that's just completely unknown to a large majority. You know what? And how do you start to break down if there is a correlation? Is there a cause, cause and effect relationship there, or what's going on? Well, I, I it, it actually there may not necessarily be a cause and effect relationship. I don't, I don't suggest that it's because countries receive USA that they engage in human rights abuses. It just so happens, though, and, and obviously the U.S tends to give more assistance to those countries, uh, you know, that are on the, you know, that are on the front lines, as it were, and so that are more likely to be um, engaged in, in, in civil wars and things like that. Um, uh, but the fact is that, you know, we hear about human rights abuses um, when, you know, 
I mean, the fact is that one of the things that drives the news in general and that drives news about human rights abuses in particular is what the leaders are saying. And so, uh, you know, we saw this in uh, we saw this in the 80s in Central America. Sorry. You know, I mean, we saw in the 80s. Okay, so just I'm just start from the. Uh uh, you know the media. And since I am focusing on the media right. and and the attention, and, and, and it seems that it's widespread, but the, the spotlight is shined on certain right. select human rights when the government. Chooses. You know, I, the human rights abuses in this world are widespread, uh, and there's a lot of information from Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and national organizations about these abuses. But when do we hear about them? We hear about them when, uh, often when it's our leaders, you know, point the finger. And we saw that in Central America in the 1980s, um, that all of a sudden uh, the Reagan administration was talking about, you know, atrocities in Nicaragua. And so the media started focusing on atrocities in Nicaragua. Uh, uh, you know, as opposed to atrocities in El Salvador, for instance. Uh, which were uh, being committed by a U.S.-backed government and didn't receive nearly the same kind of attention. And I think we see this pattern that, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, it's not just in human rights, but that the news media tends to follow an agenda or at least has to respond to an agenda um, that is, uh, you know, proactively pushed um, by the centers of power. And do you see any pattern of the government's actions of uh, when it's in, let's say, economic interest, they'll, they'll forgive human rights violations, let's say in China or somewhere where there's, you know, just kind of a waving the hands and uh, ignoring yeah. it if it's in some sort of economic interest. I think we've seen, uh, you know, for many years, not just under this administration, but also under the Clinton administration and previous administrations. Uh, that it's very easy to stand up for human rights uh, when uh, either it's the, the abuses are being committed by an enemy um, or where you know it's a little country like Burma with, with, with no strategic interest. Um, but as soon as profits are at stake or you know there's a bigger economic interest at stake, uh, human rights tend to get subordinated. And I think the best example of that is China uh, under the Clinton administration. Uh, for years, there had been a process of uh, denying China or conditioning China's most favored nation status on its human rights record. And during the Clinton administration, at a certain point, President Clinton said, "Look, you know, this is this is this is this is interfering too much um, with business relationships." And and Clinton and the Democrats um, ended this yearly review and gave China permanent most favored nation status so that human rights would not interfere um, with, uh, you know, with these business interests. And do you see any, I mean, I guess it may be outside of your mandate to, to follow the causal path, the cause and effect relationship of, of why human rights occur, the situations occur, but maybe it's within, but do you see that, you know, certain economic conditions that may create poverty or, or uh, something else uh, or what, what are some of the factors that, that create an environment for human rights? Well, I think, that, I think there's no doubt that uh, competition over resources um, and, uh, uh, you know, create, and poverty um, are factors in, in human rights. I mean, there's no, you know, it's, 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 it's no great, uh, you know, discovery uh, that poor countries or countries that, uh, where there is inequality um, abuse human rights uh, more than more than rich countries, and and uh, you know countries generally do not leaders do not abuse human rights mostly uh, because they're sadists because they they, they just want to um, people uh, repre commit repression um, because it's a way of staying in power because it's a way of protecting for the leaders and for their groups uh, the the economic interests that we have that they have and so. Uh, you know, we see peop ethnic groups or, or political groups uh, or regional groups marginalized and, and, and their rights denied um, so that they can't compete uh, for those resources or so that the people who are in power can maintain their control over resources. I don't think that's a great mystery.
Okay. Well, I think it is a mystery in a way because it's never talked about yeah. by the news media. And it's, it's if there's institutions that, that say the media who also have economic interests, that right. it's in their interest to not cover it. So can you uh, speak to, you know, if as an organization, Human Rights Watch, you know, what kind of barriers do you run into when you try to get this information out there? Well, of course, you know, it's very difficult to, um, I mean, human rights is not uh, hard news, first of all, um, unless the government has made it into hard news. Um, uh, and it's not, you know, we have to go out and kind of make that into news. And, and, and you know, as I think you have, I think there, you know, there are a few factors at work. One is um, that there is just a lot of fatigue with those kinds of stories that it's it's uh, uh, you know this this is not the agenda that has been set um, uh, and and um, let me have to think about that a little more How, I have by the way I, I can't do this for too much okay. longer I think, um, uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, let me just do a quick you know I think I got just about everything I need here um. Oh, uh, yeah, just, just to, uh, this could be the last question. The, um, uh, go through the, uh, in order for long term plan of justice for bringing, let's say, Saddam Hussein specifically to justice, the first step would be to uh, indict him. And then, go through what would happen next, the arrest, the trial, and then the, the prosecution, sure. the justice. So those those different steps that could have happened as a viable alternative to... Or that, you're not talking about what will happen now, the no, process that started right, yesterday. That, that, no, that, but that could have happened before the war. Okay. So in the context of leading up to the war, another option to war could have been this, and then this, sure. this, this, and this. You know, one of the alternative ways to go might have been... I'm sorry. Well, alternative ways to go with... Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the ways to deal with Saddam Hussein, the way that we proposed, uh, was to go the judicial route. Uh, so you indict Saddam Hussein. Now, now the crimes that he's alleged to have committed, genocide, you know, mass murder, crimes against humanity, torture, war crimes, are crimes uh, of universal jurisdiction in the sense that any country has the right sitting as a court of, of, of the world community uh, to indict Saddam Hussein for those kinds of crimes. Just like Judge Garcon in, in Spain uh, indicted Pinochet for crimes committed in Chile. So you have a, a European court uh, that indicts Saddam Hussein for genocide and, uh, or crimes against humanity that conducts an investigation uh, that uh, hears witnesses who come to that place, uh, that issues, uh, you know, an indictment um, that perhaps freezes uh, his assets, um, and that begins a process of delegitimizing him so that other countries then are called on to respect the indictment, um, not to deal with Saddam Hussein, and you begin a process of undercutting his regime and undercutting his authority. And then, if he, how does justice eventually happen? You know, a lot of people, that I, when I've told that to them, they say, well, you have to go in and get him. You know, that's certainly one way to do it. And I think, you I'm know, sorry, what is um, sir, uh, certainly one possibility, uh, one possible end game for a justice strategy is that you do get uh, a, uh, a, a UN resolution uh, to go in to get Saddam Hussein. Now, maybe in, in you know, in the political, maybe the political uh, uh, route would have worked differently had the, the goal of the, in, the, the process been the capture and the trial of Saddam Hussein rather than, you know, the overthrow of a regime and the occupation of Iraq. That's just one possibility. The other possibility is that, you know, slowly, 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 um, uh, as, in, as in Yugoslavia, the people uh, would have, uh, or the army would have overthrown Saddam Hussein. I mean, it's hard to predict. There's no guarantee that, you know, the justice route would have worked, but it would have played out 
different, differently, and the interests the, would have been a legal interest. And so it would have been perhaps perceived as you know, a victory for the rule of law rather than undermining the rule of law. And do you see the, the court that's happening now as uh, having less legitimacy, or do you have any uh, viewpoints at all on the, the current form of justice that's being uh, withdrawn? You know, there, there's, there, there are very few people in the world who so richly deserve to be brought to justice and put on trial as Saddam Hussein. Um, but the process by which he's being brought to justice increasingly appears political. Uh, it looks like the United States is really uh, calling the shots, pulling the strings here and, uh, behind the court. And unfortunately, it may not have the legitimacy uh, that, that one would hope uh, the trial of, a, of, a, of an alleged mass murderer uh, would have. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> that was great. That was really